Brett, if I didn't know any better, your guest sounds like he could actually be your brother from a different mother. Oh, wait a minute, Paul, how do you pronounce your last name? Makowitz. Makowitz, I had it right, okay. This is take two in three, two, and one. Brett, if I didn't know any better, your guest sounds like he could be your brother from a different mother. Paul Makowitz is the founder and CEO of Hashtag Smart Marketing, and he deals with strategy, SEO, social media, and the like, but he is a vet who talks about values, rather like you, Brett Henderson. So how did the two of you meet? Patrice, good morning. Thank you so much for the introduction. That's great. You're welcome. So question, how did we meet on LinkedIn? And uh, brother from a different mother, I, hopefully this will turn into something where we have videos soon. I've said that a couple times, but yeah, we're both ginger beards, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And I think if I hadn't been using Rogaine since 2002, we would have the same hairstyle too. But my some of my follicles are still hanging on the top up there. But uh, Paul, you kind of you kind of given up there. But uh, that's how we met. Yeah, I mean, I I saw myself. I saw some pictures of myself at a wedding when I was in my late 20s, and I had a uh, I had two paths that I could take. Either I could start buying Rogaine and Propecia and attacking this thing, or uh, just bite the bullet. I'm one of those person, one of those types of people. Uh, I don't care enough about how I look to really invest that much time and effort into it. A razor is good enough for me. Well, someone actually thinks you're good looking enough to marry, right? So mm -hmm. you're married. Tell, tell me about that and, and your uh, little bundle of joy, your new bundle of joy. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I just became a father uh, eight months ago. Uh, my my son, his name is Lennox, Arizona. Whoa. And yeah, it's a cool name because my, my wife and I were... Uh, we're interesting people. We're interesting <laughs> cats. Uh, we, <laughs> we're both New Yorkers, but we have lived uh, in Miami together, and we moved out to California together. Um, and where we met in New York, she's this uh, beautiful brunette that works in high end luxury, living up in Harlem. I was a uh, uh, a hustler, digital marketing expert, doing trade shows every weekend. And uh, you know, after we we met on Bumble, you know, a nice little dating app. And uh, after some back and forth and me having to cancel the first date, almost cancel the second date because I was too hungover from a Christmas party from uh, that digital marketing company, uh, she finally dragged my ass up to Harlem. And we met there on Lennox Ave at a little coffee shop. And that's that's how our son ended up being named Lennox. And that's uh, cool. yeah, and, and with that, uh, we were supposed to get married in April 2020. April, mm, I think it was timing. April 7th, 2020. Yes. So needless to say, three weeks before this wedding that she had been planning for a year and a half, uh, you know, COVID hit, she had to cancel everything. And you know, it was pretty devastating. But us being the type of people we are, you know, she gets the furloughed from her job. I have my own company, so I can kind of take take off what time I, I need. We ran over, rented a camper van, drove to Arizona because all of California was closing. We tried hitting up a courthouse in San Diego. We were trying, uh, we got up to Joshua tree. We we're like, ah, we'll just stay here for the weekend and you know, watch some stars. We we're going to go to Phoenix. And then my dad calls me on Sunday afternoon and says, Hey, uh, Phoenix courthouse is just closed. So you're not getting married there, there either. So we woke up at about eight o'clock in the morning and drove to the first town across the border, Parker, Arizona, you know, no Parker. kicked down. Yeah. kicked down the door and we're like, all right, need a wedding. Uh, we need a marriage license. Who's got it? And, uh, you know, this it's a it's a crazy story of us uh, literally traveling all around the town. I had to pay a guy walking out of the probation office 50 bucks to be one of our witnesses. That's awesome. Yeah, he's sitting there smoking a cigarette. The, the best part is when he signed our marriage license, his name was uh, it was Johnny Starr was his name. And okay. uh, he signed it. Big Johnny with a big star <laughs> on our marriage license. That's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Did you yeah, frame that? Is that up on the wall? Oh, it should be. I think it should be I packed away that. somewhere. Yeah, but um, but yeah, and so my wife and I we we brought our welcomed our first son into the world in in January, and just like everything in our life, it, it was uh crazy and hectic. But we are um, we are the type of people that adapt and overcome, you know. So my wife tested positive for COVID the same day her water broke, Jeez. and yeah, and we had gone through the entire time planning to do a home birth. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the medical system. I, I didn't like the idea of bringing a kid into the world under some bright fluorescent lights, screaming, uh, you know, getting yanked out. Uh, so, you know, we want to do a uh, home birth and you know, be in a very loving environment for the kid. But of course, our, our midwife, as soon as Lauren had COVID, she wouldn't, wasn't willing to 
do yeah. it anymore. So uh, I'm calling, end up calling six different hospitals at three o'clock in the morning, Jeez. trying to find one that would even let me in the room because mm-hmm. all their COVID restrictions um, were just, you know, so restrictive. Right. And I was like, I'm in my mid thirties. I'm healthy. I've had COVID once already. I got vaccinated. Like I've checked every single box for you and I can't get in this room. I was just, I was, I was at the point where I was, uh, I already start cussing some people out and being like, you people have you've lost all common sense. Um, luckily, we found a hospital downtown LA, Good Samaritan Hospital, and uh, did some sweet talking. And they said, you know what? You're right. We feel it's more important that the father's there than any restriction. I'm like, I could let my wife just cough on me. Like, I'll have COVID in 10 minutes, right? Let's right. do this. Well, Didn't cool. matter. We got yeah. Lennox, Arizona is now here. Yeah. And so that's you're getting how... some sleep now. And, and how does that how does that work with uh, your business? How do you how do you split your time? Um, you know, really not not too hard. We have an office downtown where a lot of my production staff is. Uh, I am relocating to South Carolina at the end of this month. It's uh, it's October, so uh, I've been working remotely basically for the last like two months, preparing them for having to not have me there and manage themselves and things like that. As far as the the kid, you know, we. And again, my wife and I were, were a little weird. We we didn't want to stick him into, you know, you know uh, a daycare where, mm-hmm. you know, he's going to have a, we, we'd love the interaction with other children and things like that. But, you know, you don't need to teach a, a six month old anything. That kid just right. needs love. Right. Uh, yeah. So what we were really looking for was a home daycare, somebody that, you know, wasn't going to stick him in front of a TV or was going to sit here and try and you know, teach him all this stuff at that age. We just want someone that's going to hold him and love him and, and enjoy him. And so we interviewed quite a few ladies and we found uh, this wonderful woman not too far. And so it's really, uh, you know, it's all about discipline and routines and everything. So wake up early, play with the kid for a little bit, get them all riled up and then get them changed. Uh, I've got a nice convertible Mustang. So he, he likes riding in the back of the Mustang with the top down. He loves there you it. Go. So yeah, take him down to down the street to the daycare and Drop them off, get my butt here, and uh, jump right into work. And crank, huh? That's good. Well, before we, we talk about work, why don't you tell me briefly what you did in the Army? Just just kind of overview the couple of years you were in, what you did, and kind of how, how you came out of the Army. Yeah, uh, I was a 13 Delta, which is a computer operator for field artillery. So I, I went to college for a year, changed my major four times, had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I was selling golf clubs to a guy at Dick's Sporting Goods. Um, I've always been a big fan of golf. It's uh, kind of sprinkled in throughout my entire career. And, you know, in being as open a person I am, I was like, yeah, I have no idea what I want to do. You know, he's like, well, I got an option for you. It's like, I, <laughs> you know, uh, one of six kids and always been a bit of the wild child. So I just showed up at my parents' house. I was like, hey, I joined the army and leave in two weeks. Uh, okay. Love you guys. I'll see you in a couple of years. I, I figured it was good. Um, Good opportunity to get some direction in my life. Good opportunity to get some college money, um, figure things out, serve the country. It was after nine, I enlisted after 9-11, so there was definitely uh, some patriotism to it. My father was in the Air Force National Guard. My grandfather was a tanker in World War II. So, Not. yeah, Not. so um, <laughs> definitely had the, the uh, heritage there for it. Uh, so I was the... Put it simply, I was the smart guy in field artillery. You know, you smart got guy. the smart guy. I was the I was the computer operator. So you would have Ford observers and infantry who would call me and say, "Hey, we're taking fire from you know, this ridge," or they could give they give it to me in all sorts of ways. You know, mills, degrees, give me a direction <laughs> and uh, and a distance. Like, and, and we could figure it out with a computer program. And then howitzers because you're shooting such a large round and it's rotating so fast it's going to drift to the right you know humidity will make it not go as far there's it's all sorts of uh different um, pieces of that algorithm and basically i had to figure it out and do it in about 25 30 seconds call down to the gun bunnies tell them you know this round this this many white bags this many red bags uh turn turn crank 22 times this way you know, turn the other crank 32 this way, pull string, go boom. All right. All so, right, cool. yeah, so I was, uh, yeah, I was basically the middleman uh, whenever we needed some some things blown up. And then spent a little over a year in Iraq. I got um, extended twice when I was over there. And uh, 
actually, I guess a third time because I, I even got back to Kuwait and thought it was it and only to find out that we had to do one more convoy and they needed a volunteer. And since you know, I was a young guy, I was like 21 at the time, uh, not married, didn't have a girlfriend. And I was like, That's, you guys go home, I'll do this. And so I did one last convoy mission without my unit uh, back up into Sadr City, which is like the, the ghetto of Baghdad. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, up in northeast Baghdad. Uh, and then came back, and when I got back, I informed them I wasn't reenlisting, and so my entire unit was getting relocated to Washington State, and that was the the second ACR, which was down. I was stationed in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, it's a uh, it's an interesting place to get <laughs> yeah. to get uh, stationed at. You know, it's funny when you go through basic, they give you like those options, like fill out your wish list, like. I was like, I don't know, send me to Germany, send me to Hawaii, send me to Colorado. I, I even put on there, send me to Fort Drum, New York, which nobody wants to go to Fort Drum. It's cold. It's like in Watertown, north of Syracuse, tons of snow. I was like, worst case scenario, I'll be somewhat close to family. And they get the, I get Fort Polk. Yeah, so, in, the, in the bayou. In the bayou. It's a very interesting place. Um, Learned a lot, <laughs> we'll say. Uh, but I spent the last year, year and change that I was in, uh, playing oppositional forces at the joint readiness training center jrtc so is training that different from of, ntc is that ntc or the is that it, the old ntc they changed the name no it's the just uh just different yeah it's just the fort polk version okay so yeah. it's the the op four not not in fort Irwin, but in in so in louisiana the bayou versus the desert yep exactly yeah, okay very, very similar i have a bunch of little little pop-up cities kind of built and you know, they, they go through basically war games, um, teaching them a lot of stuff that we had to do over there, which is like providing security for elections and how to work with contractors. And uh, so me getting to play oppositional forces, I you know, basically got to scream at them in whatever Arabic that I could remember, cause chaos, uh, using Mills gear and shooting yep, people from, yep. from the laser from the tag tower. Remember yeah, the glory days. Remember yep. the glory days. Let's, let's shift then. So I appreciate you giving some background there. But when you made up your mind to leave, when we first had a conversation, you told me about a story or your first company, which didn't go as as planned. And so remembering our audience is entrepreneurs and everyone's looking for the mindset, you know, successful mindset of an entrepreneur, kind of walk me through that first business. And I don't need all the details, the facts, but I really want to go through the emotional state. So you had your business, you were trying to get your I'll let you talk about the, what the business was and where it was set up. But just when you realized it wasn't quite working out the way you thought it was going to work out, I just want to he hear you share in your own words. And it's a little personal, right? Because it's mm -hmm. it's it's not a success story initially. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that. And I think our audience would too, because every time you start a business, you're not always successful. And most businesses fail in the first three years. So I'll, I'll stop there. Why don't you kind of share your first mindset of what you thought would be a good business? And then as you went through it and you realized, oh, it's maybe not what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, my so my career, it's 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 like a very meandering kind of circuitous type career, because um, when I got out of the military, I became a, a golf pro for a few years. So I was giving lessons. Best job in the world. Uh, I just couldn't make any money doing it. So mm. uh, so eventually I had to, I just stopped doing that. I started working for Dick Sporting Goods again, became a business analyst for them. Eventually got relocated a few places. You just got burnt out on that. Um, there's a guy I was playing golf with. He was opening this new driving range, indoor golf simulators, bar, restaurant, entertainment center. And so he hired me to come run it. And uh, I was very good at it. I, I increased his profits by about 500000 the very first year I was there. Uh, and it was just a lot of that was through like digital marketing and understanding how to get awareness about how cool this place was. But uh, then I was getting burnt out on being back in Buffalo. Uh, I was brushing snow off my car for like the you know, third week in a row. Right. Being like, this sucks. Uh, and so my sister lived in New Mexico. So I just said, you know, what? I'm in. Let's let's just uh, let's try something new. So I drove out there and uh, I was playing golf. Surprise, surprise. Met a guy. He had this idea for a scooter rental company. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. I think, uh, I think I'd get on board with that. I took the. Basic what year was this? Oh, geez. Would have been, it's like 2014, probably. Okay. 2014, 2015. About eight, um, eight seven no, years ago. Actually, 2013. It's 2013. Yeah. So okay. a, while, a while ago. Um, 
you know it's funny it's like i think about my history i can't even like put dates to things anymore like it's all just a blur that, that's called my life <laughs> um so i meet this dude and uh i decide to invest about 10 grand and buy about 20 scooters and uh basically what we built was he had one location in Ruidoso, which is this cute little mountainy town in New Mexico. And I said, if we're going to do this, let's let's put a location in Albuquerque. Let's put a location in Santa Fe and Cloudcroft and Roswell. And, you know, let's let's hit up all these places because the overhead, honestly, was nothing. You know, we're renting a parking space, basically, for a day. We would do a little pop-up shop. Um, we'd buy these scooters for, you know, like 450 bucks or so. When we'd get the 49cc scooters. So they were, uh, you didn't have to have a helmet. Uh, you literally just, all you had to have was a driver's license and you could battery, ride battery powered or yep. Fully bad. Oh, well gas powered, but, um, I had a little battery for the starter and, uh, honestly that like, they're not great quality, but they got the job done. Right. It gave people the fun excitement of scooting around their little, uh, their little vacation town that okay. they were in. And, uh, so I was, you know, hired a few people to kind of manage these shops. One thing I will tell you is New Mexico is the hardest place I've ever found to like keep people for more than like a week. Why? I'd have people that I don't know what it is, man. It's it's a it's a tough place. In New Mexico, I don't know if you anybody that's ever spent any significant amount of time there. Um the Native American population is uh they have a, a, a lot of issues, we'll say in the area with um with alcoholism. Like I had people stealing scooters uh i'd have one person like pull me one way to like show them the scooter and how to start it and another guy's over there stealing keys off the desk like running to try and steal one i'd like tackle a guy like Jeez. it was yeah it, and and then finding employees that could manage a situation like that was also not exactly the easiest thing in the world uh, so it was it was a lot of uh a lot of finding the right places to be for it but this this company for all the struggles and everything uh i mean i was sleeping in a car probably like two nights a week. Right. Uh, I was driving, you know, driving 20 hours a week, you know, just hitting all the locations, making sure that things were running right, having to work at a location for a day, you know, basically every single day I was working at a different location. Because um, of staffing or? Yeah, yeah. Well, to to cover days off for the people that we would have. Um, and then New Mexico, it's a pretty big state. I mean, getting from Ruidoso to Santa Fe is like four or five hour drive. So it's not like it's, you know, real quick skip, hop and a jump um, right, yeah. around. Uh, I was, I had an air mattress in my car and I would just sleep in the back of the shops some <laughs> days, just, you know, just to, just to catch some sleep. And uh, my business partner was absolutely zero help. I mean, this guy was just a hindrance. He he fired my, my best mechanic because the guy asked for a raise without talking to me. Um, and he was the majority owner. I was the minority owner and operator. So yep. it was a, uh, he was the money guy. Yeah, he's a money guy. And and he, you know, I bust my ass like real, real hard for, for a whole year running that company. And um, eventually it, it was just, I mean, I started getting like these pains in my feet. I didn't know if I was getting like fibromyalgia or, or uh, you know, or if I had something else. I found out I had Lyme disease when Jeez. I was there. Like I was running into some issues and <laughs> really just beating the shit out of myself. Right. Um, and then a, a buddy of mine who he's been my best friend since we were like four years old, we, we met each other first day at kindergarten. So, um, he called me up one day cause I'd always talked about going and living in New York city and I never had, I'd lived in, you know, Atlanta for a few years as golf pro in Buffalo and Rochester and New Mexico, but I'd never actually gone and lived in the city. And I just saw it as uh, I call him my Moses. I'm like, dude, you like, you led me out of the desert, you know, right. Like you, uh, he basically said, Hey, I've got a couch, a roommate moving out, uh, figure, figure out what you'll do for work and come on out. And so passed everything over to this new, or, or to the, to the owner. I said, Hey, or sell all scooters. I don't care what you do. So uh, when was, let's, let's talk about that. So there had to be a pivotal moment or that one day you're in the back of your car. It's been there for a year. Your feet are hurt and you got Lyme's disease. And I hear that's brutal, <laughs> right? I'm from Pennsylvania too. So Lyme's disease, Lyme's disease was a big thing from ticks when I was growing up or was getting to be a big thing. Now it's gypsy moths that destroy it, all the forests all summer long. But w when was the pivotal defining moment when you're in there and you're trying to make this work? It was, I mean, was revenue coming in? Was it going out? Were you, were you seeing the money or were you kept away from the money? No, the, the biggest issue was the day that I sat down with him at this little restaurant and I said, 
Yeah, I'm I'm behind two weeks in pay. You owe me money. Like, what's going on here? You have access to everything. You're the one that's handing out the checks. Uh, why why is my pay getting held up and I'm the one working doing all the work for this busting my ass? Right. And um, and I remember him looking at me and he he basically just said, "Well, you know, I just I don't think we're performing to the level that we should be." And I was like, "You know, you fired my my mechanic." So now I'm doing mechanic work on scooters. I'm working all these shops. I'm doing everything I can. I'm, I'm hiring people that are not showing up a few days later. Like I don't know what else to do. I was kind of at my at my wits end, right? Um, and you felt now, alone. Did you feel alone when you were in that space? Oh, Did you feel horrible. very alone? Yeah, yeah. We we call it. Um, my middle name is Richard, and so when I'm when I'm being a bit of an asshole, my friends call me Dicky. Of course. Uh, and so we we we, re- we refer to those days as the dark days of Dicky. Because like I wasn't talking to anybody, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, you know, even my family, I wasn't talking to all that much. I was just head down, busting my ass, and you know, a year later, I nothing, you know, I hadn't gone anywhere. nothing to show for it, nothing to show for it. I, I was, you know, not getting paid now for all this work I'd done, and at that point, I was just like, worst case scenario, like worst case scenario of leaving, going to New York City. Like, I'll find a job. I'm very hireable. I'm <laughs> personable. Like, I'll figure it out. Right. I'm like, worst case scenario, well, I, I don't get this money from this dude. I lost my $10,000 investment. You know, I, I learned a lot. I mean, I ran that entire company. He had no, he had like some paper contracts that he was using. I I basically built the company off of Google and Google Forms. And I taught myself how to write scripts so that like, as soon as somebody submit a form, it would send them a PDF. It would send us a PDF. They could sign right on the right on the iPad. I ran the entire company from iPads. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and then and I, you built it, it yourself. Yeah, yeah. I built all the forms and all the scripts and everything. And I was using the, the rental agreements or what, what? What kind of scripts or what forms? What? It... Yeah. So he had he had a rental agreement already that he had um, he had produced. Uh, so I took that and basically made the digital version of it and made it so that uh, I really wanted to have the experience of when people got there, it was efficient and quick and like felt very put together. Right. And so uh, basically I made like a little uh, three minute video on safety on the scooter and they could just take a picture of their driver's license and it would save it and it would fill out the form submission. Uh, they would sign right on it, hit that submit. They would get an email. I would get an email and then a GPS tracker would activate. On awesome. The and sounds, it was all a good yeah, system. Yeah, it was it was a great system. Um I I really wanted to build something that was super efficient and, and I could be easily replicated because my my goal to have these locations not just in New Mexico, but like take this thing nationwide or do something cool with it. Right. Um and so I was always and that's something that I, I still have with me today is where I, every time I'm building something, I'm not thinking about how this is gonna work next week. I'm always thinking about how this is gonna work two years down the road, three years down the road. Um and it's reflected in some of the technology that that we utilize today, uh, but it, it all comes from these lessons that you learn uh, along the way. You know, it's it's not just the the good things to do, but it's also like the bad things to do. Well, it's all about the, that's how the lessons are the failures, right? Those are the big ones. And when it succeeds, you don't really call it a lesson. You're like, oh, that's that's the plan. It was always going to happen that way, right? When actually you get lucky, but but if you keep setting yourself up and you put the system procedures in place, you do the work, you do the activity. Eventually, you have success if it all gels together. But you said you're doing this for a year and banging your head and trying. And so you have the long term vision. But at one point, you're just like, dude, enough's enough. So it was when you had your come to Jesus meeting with your partner and he, and he wouldn't pay you yeah. if you're doing everything. And, you're yeah. like, and that was enough. You're like, I'll walk away from the sweat equity. I'm done. And you just said, I'm, I'm out. I, I'm worth more than this. Well, what was the mindset at that meeting? What was the triggering thought? I've always been one to jump at opportunities. Um, I like change in my life. I feel like that's it's one of my really strong qualities is that I, I adapt well and I I change and I can pivot quickly. Um, and at that moment, I I truly just thought worst case scenario, like the best case scenario of me staying here and toughing this out and working with this guy is. I don't know. Maybe I, I make a little bit of money and, uh, you know, we, we somehow find a way to work and, you know, I find some way to, to take a little bit of the beating off my body or the potential of go to New York city. Uh, I 
got an interview with a digital marketing company. Uh, and I was like the 15th, 16th employee that was going to be at that office. And they had plans for bringing in lots of employees. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just basically weighed the options and, and thought, you know, I, from a mindset, I, I know that I have a shit ton of potential in me. Like I've always been told that my entire life, right. I always felt like I was the underachiever my entire life. Uh, Everybody, you know, it's always like, oh, you know, you're so personable and and you're likable. I was a good athlete. Um, I was voted, what? I was what? voted cutest senior boy in my high school. Or, like, was I, it a school of the blind or what? Exactly. Yeah, it was a <laughs> very small buses. Um, and yeah, exactly. So, uh, I I've always been like successful in a lot of things, but never never hit that potential. Like, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I always I was always so jealous of these people that like know what they want to do when they were a kid. Like. I, I own a digital marketing company right now and we're, and we're fairly successful, you know, we're, we're constantly growing. And I still go like, like, I like digital marketing. I like the psychology, like the buying psychology of how people make decisions. But you know what? Like my, my dream would be to go play on the PGA champions tour when I turn 50. Right. So like what I think being a creature of uh, embracing discomfort <laughs> and embracing unknown uh, it, it really it probably drives people crazy around me, probably drives my wife crazy. Um, but it's, I feel like there's, there's only so many opportunities in this world. And if you're not jumping at them and you're taking, taking those chances, then you know, you're gonna, you're gonna get to the pearly gates one day. And I, I feel like that's what death is, right? You get up there and they say, this is the life you lived. This is the life you could have lived. And I want mine to match that life you could have lived as, as much as possible. And so when it came down to, okay, I can stick this out for another year, keep beating the shit out of myself and try to make this succeed. Or, you know what? The grass could be greener. It might not be greener. And if it's not greener, I'm okay with that too. Right. It's because I'll find, I'll find something else. Right. Uh, but it worked out Right, I got up there. I was like the 15th employee on that floor uh, a year and a half later, there's, 300 people on that floor. We're an Inc. 500 fastest growing company two years in a row. Uh, I'm making really good money. Um, instead of fixing scooters and driving all day and sleeping on an air mattress, I'm uh, I'm in a nice apartment in the Upper East Side and you know, walking through Times Square on my way to work every morning and you know helping business owners, you know, realize their potential. And help right. them, you know, start start uh, advertising better online and, and building their business in in uh, in a new world that they didn't understand, where all these buying decisions were even being made online. And they were like, "Well, I'm in the phone book." Like it was that time, right? right. They, they like still hadn't even hadn't even figured it out yet. I'm like, "Yeah, well, you need a Facebook page." Um, and so helping business owners kind of get to that, uh, I truly like found a, a passion more than anything. I mean, digital marketing is is that's the vehicle. But the passion I have is helping businesses like actualize their potential and and realize that you know they are a, a positive influence on their local community, that they can really make a difference in other people's lives if they're doing it right. But digital marketing is the the vehicle in which I use to do that. So when you when you say that, because most business owners, entrepreneurs, you're a master technician in something first, right? You're an accountant. And you become a CPA. Hey, you got your master technician doing taxes. And then, oh, let me start a CPA firm, right? And then you're a doctor first and you work in a hospital and you get really proficient in whatever your specialty is, whether you're internal medicine or OBGYN or surgeon, whatever that is, ENT. And then, hey, let me start my own business. So most business owners are master technicians first and you become very proficient in one skill set. I in the financial services, I have of my previous skill set where I was a ma I still am a master technician in one or two areas, which I don't want to say because then you get pigeonholed as expert in one of those areas. So I, <laughs> I don't even let people know my my expertise anymore because I don't want to be pigeonholed in that one when that one area, the one skill set. But what would you say then for these entrepreneurs that are engaging you? Well, number one, how do you find them? Are you going to them? Or are they coming to you? And then actually let's just go there. Yeah, these business owners that you're finding and helping are they coming to you realizing they need help or are you like, Hey dude, and you're influencing them to the point like, Oh, maybe there is a different way. Maybe they're going down this one path, this one forest. 
and they think they're fine. And then all of a sudden you, you show up and how does that conversation go? We're like, oh, maybe I'm not in the right forest or maybe I'm using a hatchet when I should be using an ax or I could have a chainsaw or one of those monster tiller feller mm -hmm. things that come through and knock down a forest in like five minutes. So chat more about that with the business owners because as a technician, doesn't mean you're skilled to run a business, right? You, you, I talk about your I and your R, your identity and your role. If you are a CPA, for example, and your identity is always a 10, that's your who you are as a person. My identity is always a 10, but as a CPA, if you if you are a CPA, maybe your role as a CPA is eight or nine or 10, depending on your specialty, but then running a firm and managing people and hiring people and having a benefits program and having accounts receivable and accounts payable and you know, all those different facets of the business is a whole other skill set. So that role being a business owner is generally a one or two, right? Until you get the experience. So when would a business owner or when you engage with a business owner, is there that, that, is it an epiphany? Is it a moment? Are they coming to you realizing, Hey, I need help. I want to do something different. Or are you reaching out to them saying, Hey, you could be doing something different. Yeah. I, I think with everything, it's gotta be a bit of a mix. All right. Uh, right now, two thirds of our clients have come from referrals or inbound. Okay. Only only a few of our clients uh, come in from our, our actual sales and marketing uh, efforts. It, that is the big one of the big goals that we have here for Q4 is actually really amping up our own marketing. Because uh, as I was building this company, I I the whole reason I built it was because the digital marketing companies that I worked before it. So a, a two time Inc. 500 fastest growing company. So I learned a lot about business growth. And the next one that I worked for was uh, we were a two-time Inc. 5. Um, or the first one was Inc. 500. The second one was Inc. 5000. With the first company, their average retention was like six months. For a client or employee? For a client. For a client which uh, always kind of blew my mind, right? Like if you're doing good work, you, you shouldn't be losing clients. Yeah. Uh, the, the second one, average retention is about like eight and a half months. And my last job at, at that company was the director of client success. Uh, so it was affectionately looked at as like the professional shit eater. Like when when we got to that seven, eight month level and these people didn't feel like they're getting any value anymore, it was my job to go in there and like sweet talk them and change up what we were doing and, you know, redo like a rediscovery with them, right. to, you know, reimagine some solutions for them. But and let me ask you this. Sorry, I'm going to cut you up. Were you delivering value or, or was it BS? It was, um, it was a level of value. It was with digital marketing. There are so many shortcuts that digital marketing companies take to, to really cut costs. And, you know, so that company was using a system of content for SEO that used to work, but was waning in effectiveness pretty dramatically. Okay. Um, and so they, uh, they eventually had to pivot as well. Um, and kind of how they were doing things. But my goal in starting this company was like, what if I just kept every client I signed? <laughs> like, it's this, it's this odd, uh, you know, thought to have in digital marketing because nobody stays with their digital marketing company very long, um, especially in legal and medical. Mostly because, uh, you know, there's the grass is greener. There's uh, companies like Fine Law, Scorpions, um, Patient Pop, things like that out there, which are very aggressive in their uh their marketing efforts and their sales efforts. Yeah, Patient so Pop thinks I'm a doctor. By the way, I, I see it on YouTube. I get advertised by Patient Pop twenty four like twenty four seven for some reason. Every time a YouTube ad comes on, I get Say Jude's Hospital, and I get mm. Patient Pop. I, I don't know why, but and actually, now I started getting some podcasts one because obviously I think my phone's listening to me right now. And now I'm getting podcast <laughs> thing, podcast accelerator things because we're doing this. And uh, anyway, so I don't know why Patient Pop follows me around, but some somehow they think I'm a doctor. So I understand. Well, it's funny is I did not go to the Fine Law website, but I was on a call with a uh, prospective client and talking to them about like these boring sites. Um, like there, there's this people, they're not even clients yet, but I was talking to them, but it's three female attorneys that um, do like business law and one of them does personal injury law. I mean, what a, what like a great different, differentiating factor, right? Three young attractive women attorneys that are badasses right and they got this website that looks like it's the same thing that 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 the 60 year old guy that's been doing 
you know, criminal law for 40 years built, you know, and, and I'm like, guys, like they got thrown in a lawyer box. They got thrown in the box. Yeah, that's, they that's exactly what it is. Uh, and that's, that's what these companies do. Um, like the fine law scorpion paint chip pop, all their websites look the same. Yep. Um, there's, there's no displaying the value proposition. So when I go into, when, when people get introduced to me, uh, to talk to him about marketing. I think that one of the biggest things that surprised me is how little I talk because Bullshit. I'm calling I know, you out on that. I'm I know, especially, you especially you you're a talker. Uh, I am, I am, but in, in my sales process, it's, it's consultative to the level of probably annoyance, right? Because they want me to just throw features and benefits at them. Right. But what I want is what makes you special? You know, what is it about you, you know, we talk we talk about the zero moment of truth a lot. This is a concept. Have you ever heard that concept before? No, I have not. Tell me about All right. that. All right, cool. I'm gonna give you the, the quick. Maybe you down. teach me. This is cool. This I like I like to learn. Um, so the zero moment of truth, this actually came out from Google over a decade ago. This is not a new concept. Okay. But as technology was uh becoming more prevalent in our society, you know, we all have these computers in our pockets now, uh, it changed up the traditional marketing model. The you know, if you think of like Mad Men, um, I always like to think of that because it, it really clearly identifies the three-step marketing model that businesses always had. It was awareness, you know, billboards, posters, commercials, all that, you know, even like being listed in a phone book, you know, that's all the same idea, right? People have to know you exist. All right. The next one is the experience. So, you know, I, I used this law firm. They were awesome. Uh, great. Now I'm at a family barbecue and somebody says, you know, I need an attorney. Great. Here's a referral. You know, that's, that's kind of how that business went. Uh, and and it was really like what the overall um, impression people had from that business then led you into stage three, which is advocacy. Either they're an advocate or they're not. And so right. either they're saying at that barbecue, these guys are awesome, or they're saying these guys suck, don't use them. Uh, that was traditional marketing. Just have awareness, capture, and you know, get them to talk about you. Yep. But- and that's always called awareness, first moment of truth, second moment of truth. So the zero moment of truth comes in between awareness and people actually making a buying decision. We all have these computers in our pockets. We are the Netflix generation. We are the Amazon generation. Every single thing out there in the world has stars. It has information. It has um, visuals associated with it. It has you know emotional connections that people form because most people are only on a website for about 45 seconds. So it means you got 45 seconds to tell them why you are the solution to their problem. And if you're thinking from a legal standpoint, uh, I type personal injury attorney near me, I get this quick list. That's why SEO is so important because about 80% of people click in the top uh, top chunk of SEO or the top right. chunk of organics, usually the top three. So if you're in that top three in organics, business is good. You're doing all right, all right? So um, so that's obviously a big focus that I, I always look at is you know how, we, how we're gonna get you up there. And we have some amazing technicians up here that do fantastic SEO with us. Um, and then there's like the visuals. Like if I see a map listing, all these little dots are popping up. What's the one thing that's going to make me pick this dot or that dot? You know, I've got this list on the side and stars associated with it. So if I see a three and a half and a four and a half, boom, like three and a half has gone, right? right. It's, it's, it's not even in the conversation. Now I'm looking at like two, two, four and a halves. And I click on the review so I can like read one or two of them. And you know, I see this guy, he's got a good review, no answer. He's got a bad review, no answer. All right, well, he's a, he's an attorney, right? He's when you say no guy. answer, you mean response to that review? Yeah, no, no response to that review. Are you allowed to? I thought you can't, well, depending oh on gosh. the platform. Oh, you answer, Google or every, Yelp. answer every single review. Good, bad, indifferent. Why would you not take that opportunity? If I didn't you think know you about could. That, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. You should be answering every single review that's out there. Because if you think about it this way, like if somebody came up to you face-to-face, and said, your business is shit. I had a horrible experience. Right. Like you would just like turn around and walk away. You'd be like, oh, that's awkward. Like <laughs> you'd probably say like, hey, you know, what what happened? I'd love to know more about the situation. I want to fix this. You know, I want to make sure that, you know, you're, we're meeting your expectations here. Let's talk about this. And so why wouldn't you do the exact same thing online? And so uh, one thing I know my wife does it all the time. She only reads bad reviews and she looks to see how the business kind of responds to that if their customer service is at a high level. And when you're talking about attorneys, I mean, every single one of these cases is like 10,000 in revenue, 20,000 in revenue, you know, a million in revenue if it's a big yep. case. You know, why they don't take that time to acknowledge the good reviews. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Like that's that's the exact experience we want to convey. If you 
ever have a legal situation again or you know anybody, please have them reach out to us. We'd be honored to, to have that opportunity. Now, now imagine I'm comparing two law firms and I, they both have four and a fives. So I, I look at their reviews. One of them is answering reviews like that. The other one is just leaving that stuff out in the open. Which one do I think has better customer service? And that makes perfect sense. That's a great example. Yeah. And the... then, Go ahead. Oh, oh, I was just going to say, and then you get into the visuals and because we, we look at pictures. I mean, if you don't have pictures on your Google business listing or your Yelp page that are conveying that emotional connection that you want people to, to experience when they're finding you and they're in this zero moment of truth, I'm making a deci buying decision very next step. Like the images that law firms and medical practices use blow my mind grainy you can't really tell what's going on there's no smiling faces it's maybe like or the ones that just don't put any pictures up and all it is is the google circle and i just see a giant cement building like, right you know what I, what is that doing well i think and kind of wrap it up i'm gonna hit you with one one or two nuggets right so i'm just letting you know it's coming and you you look at financial advisor space I went to a, a conference and someone's talking they do advisor websites and because we're so heavily regulated. Everyone's like, oh, what color do you want? And, and what do you want? Well, we're our guiding light for our clients. So we need a lighthouse. And and what makes you feel good? Oh, the color blue is soothing. She's so like, every financial advisor has a blue website with a lighthouse. Like everyone's the exact same. And every, everyone's going to go the same way, which is why I have a, a red target. I was like, don't use red. Red's aggressive. Like red's a bad color. It's angry. Like, boom. That's why exactly what I'm using because I don't want to be like every other financial advisor. But I think it's funny. Everyone says, if you're going to buy something, the guy goes out, wants to buy a Porsche, right? Oh, it's fun. It's beautiful. It's fast. It makes, I like the sound. It makes me feel good. But it tells his wife, oh, I just need to get to work. Just a car for me to get to work, right? Logically, you you buy something or you're engaged emotionally, right? So if your clients, you're helping them, a prospect look at their website and they feel an emotion of, if I'm looking for an injury attorney, I'm looking for money, something obviously happened, right? So I'm looking for someone that emotionally connects with me. But then when I make that decision, maybe that site is emotionally appealing, but then I, I justify it logically. I needed this attorney and they're going to help me fight my case because I was injured. But if I go to the two websites and one emotionally turns me off, the other one emotionally attracts me, obviously I'm going to go to the attorney that that attracts me because it emotionally is appealing. So chat, chat with chat about that. And that's kind of like, is that really what you do is help that business owner create an emotional experience? Is that, and how important is that versus being logical? That's, that's great. That's one reason why uh, talk about the sales process that I have. I ask so many questions is because the only way that I can properly reflect somebody online in a way that is displaying their, their value and building those emotionally connect those emotional connections quickly is if I know them pretty well. Uh, so I, I had this one attorney and one of my favorite questions to ask them is, you know, what emotion do you want people to feel when they first find out oh, about you? That's, that's everything. It's everything. Right. And so this guy said, well, I'm a personal injury attorney. I deal mostly with people that are injured. They're physically, mentally not in a great place. You know, they're, they're, I mean, if you're, if you are getting an attorney, this is not the best time of your life, Right. Right. He goes, he goes, these people, so many of them feel like a little bit somber about it. Like, like these dark clouds are are in their life. But what I want them to experience is like, when they meet me, I'm, I'm a pretty open guy. I'm a bubbly guy. This guy, like he does after school talks at the local police station for the disadvantaged kids about chasing their dreams. And he gives backpacks to the local school. Like he's a great positive impact on his local community. And he said, I want people to see me as, you know, the clouds are dissipating, there's sunlight coming through, better days are, are ahead of you, right? And what better emotion could, a, could an attorney convey, right? That better days are ahead of you. And so if you go to his website, and I could go to it, um, this is, he'll probably appreciate all the traffic. Uh, it's drakelawgroup.com. And you'll okay. see the, the hero image. You get to the site, it's him. He look, he's a good looking dude. He's got this nice suit on, smiling face. It's not... Uh, like a car accident going on or anything. It's a cityscape of LA. Clouds are dissipating. The sun's coming out. His logo, and it says, "You're safe with Drake." So the the emotion he's portraying is what is is that you're going through a hard time, and I'm here to walk you through this journey and get you on the other side in a better shape. I love it. So and, think about that for for veterans and entrepreneurs. Like, so if you're gonna give any guidance 
to a veteran entrepreneur that's getting their business running or a company that already has their business and you're trying to attract new customers, what's that one thing they need to consider when they're building their marketing program and or looking for a marketing coach? Yeah, I would say first sit down and think really hard about who you are and what you do and the value that you provide. Because I, I can't tell you how many businesses I say, like, what are your core values? And they're like, well, we kind of, and I'm like, no, like you should be able to just tell me, like you should have at least three things that are like, these are the principles in which we operate our business. That so we, we use our values about. card. I like, can't see because the, oh, we, oh, we actually have values cards where we actually run clients through and we actually help them pick mm -hmm. out their five biggest values. So before we give them any advice, we have to know their values. So I agree with what you're saying hundred percent. That was a good time. I, I just looked over my values cards are there. So that's it's, it's, perfect. It's shocking to me. I, I was taking a lot of notes as I was going through um, building our company and like all the sales meetings that I would have and some of the speaking opportunities that I had, I would ask people like, do you know your company's core values? And it, it was shocking me. I'd say maybe like five, 10% of people actually like know them. And you know, this is, this is the backbone of your business. And so would you say, yeah, so it's a, just pulling it together. Would you say that First and foremost, if you're going to look at a marketing plan or you want to grow, or you're going to hire an expert, you need to know your own values first. Mm -hmm. And then what kind of emotional connection you want those values to convey to your prospective clients or customers. Is that? Yeah, I, th I think that it's it's a process. First, you got to know your core values. Then you look at your ideal clients. And th that's another thing that people are just kind of real wishy-washy on, right? Like, oh, I can help everybody. Like, yeah, but... If you could only choose one type of person that you could work with for the rest of your life, like who would that be? Veteran entrepreneurs. And, Boom. That's mine. Perfect. And so now you cater your message to that one thing. Sure. You're going to get other people, right? Other people are going to resonate with the message. Other people maybe will just get referred to you because you know they had a great experience, but all of your marketing is catered towards that person. And so I even, I basically like force them, force a lot of my clients into really thinking about these things. And, and it's something that, they've never done because you know they had one business class in law school right got it they, they never actually like, sat down and thought about that thing and so i i tell them like is it a man or a woman I'm like well i like both i'm like no is it a man or a woman like what is it um how old are they what are they doing how do they spend their time um and i get them to like form this picture and now when i'm building a graphic like for for drake he said um you know what it's usually a woman mother of two you know, she's 35 to 45. She, you know, I get, got him to really like dig into this. And now when you get to the website, you know, that's who we're talking to. Other people are going to relate to it for sure. Right. But if we're, if we're hitting that target market. Um, so, let me jump in. So what you're saying then for any veteran entrepreneur business or any business, but if you're also a veteran entrepreneur, that's who, who we're chatting, chatting ideally is listening to this. It's understand your values. First and foremost, understand your ideal client prospect number two. And then have, if you don't have the skill set to draft that message, an organization like yours could help them with that, correct? Yeah. yeah and sure. so I'm going to ask you right now, how would someone, how would a veteran entrepreneur find you? What's your contact information? How would they find you and know, uh, know how to reach you? Yeah. So just like we were talking about Zmot earlier, uh, zmotexpert.com is, that's Spell that. just Z-M-O-T. Z-M-O-T. Expert.com. As in as in Zulu Mike Oscar Tango. There we expert. go. Com. There we go. Um that so that is um that's kind of like my my personal page that I use a lot of stuff for. So like my calendar's on there. You know, you can I have uh a lot of free resources. We have a webinar out for how to optimize your Google business listing. We got just say it, say it twice though. Keep it simple so they can reach you and then your phone number too. Oh uh, for perfect. Um I also uh I operate most off a calendar. So that's why I say go grab a time in my calendar. Uh because they can pull that from I, your website. Yep. And they can pull that right from zmotexpert.com. We also have hashtags dash smart.com, but also LinkedIn. You can just look for me. It's uh Zmot Expert. Zmot Expert. Also. So, yeah. So you can always find me on LinkedIn. And uh as far as the company phone, yeah, give me a call at 323-716-2021. Say that again. It's three two three seven one six. Two zero two one. Awesome, Paul. Patrice, before yes, you yell sir. at us, come back, say hello. What I missed. I think we're going to have to set up some more time so we can just keep these things going. You've got really good stuff here. But, Brett, how can listeners reach you? Oh, sure thing. Hit us on our website, book a call, swe90.com, Strategic Wealth Endeavor, Sierra Whiskey Echo. 
Niner0.com and you book a call and happy to chat with anybody about uh, anything, really. If you're a veteran, just want to chat. I don't even talk about my business anymore. It's really just trading stories with entrepreneurs. It's kind of cool and, uh, and I actually love it. So Patrice, that's how they reach me. All right. Very good. And now all you guys who are listening, simplify your lives. All you have to do is follow the podcast. That way you won't miss an episode. And please share with others who would appreciate what Brett and his guests offer. Thank you.